was actually here the last time in 2003 when my family and I were skiing down in Queenstown. Uh, our most favorite slopes of the remarkable is the Coronet Peak. And before that, I was actually in Auckland in the year 1998. As you know, 1998 was a meaningful year for many countries in Asia by way of the crisis that we all confronted. That time I was a banker. I was assigned to do a bit of benchmarking of port activities and port operatorships. So I had the privilege and honor of visiting the Port of Auckland and also the Port of Taranga. And I remember quite vividly in my car journey from Auckland to Taranga over about four and a half hours, uh, I didn't come across any more than 25 cars on the highway. <laughs> so that was, that was my vivid, you know, impression of New Zealand. But it didn't stop me from coming back in 2003 uh, when I had a really great time with my wife and kids. And I even brought my brothers and sister and their kids. And we had a great time. So I'm back in 2012. And I want to thank the New Zealand Asia Institute uh, for inviting me and, of course, the university again for allowing me to spend a few minutes to talk about Indonesia. I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that the University of Auckland has produced and been affiliated with many great minds uh, in New Zealand, uh, including a couple of your prime ministers. Uh, and I know uh, one famous actress uh, who went to this university who acted as the warrior, Zena. Uh, and, you know, my wife is a much bigger fan of hers than I am. I'm, I'm still a very big fan of hers. Uh, and I've always been fascinated with how New Zealand has created so much soft power for itself and also, you know, for the region. I do sense it when I attend meetings and summits, whether it's the Asia Pacific or APEC summit or some others, uh, regionally or internationally, the New Zealanders have always been very good at projecting the regional aspirations and also New Zealand's aspirations in ways that would have been very much acceptable uh, to how everybody thinks. I want to just uh, spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes talking about three things. The first is with regards to Indonesia's history. And the second is with regards to Indonesia's economic development. And the third, Indonesia's future. Uh, I think if we roll back you know, more than a thousand years, uh, about a few billion people ago, in the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th centuries, Indonesia had its moment of significance on the global map. And I think one of the highlights would have been Indonesia's coming on board with the construction of the biggest Buddhist temple in Java. It's entitled Borobudur, which was basically symbolic of the Shalendras dynasty becoming magnificent for the people of Java, but also at the same time for the people of Indonesia. It was a monument, it was a temple that was built with six large square platforms, platforms taught by three circular platforms with over 2,500 you know, relief panels and a few other hundreds of Buddha statues. And this basically resembled and represented Indonesia's mark on the global map. And it kind of slept for a few hundred years, and it woke up again in the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. And the highlight of which was the prominence of the Majapahit dynasty, during which there was a guy by the name of Hayam Wuruk, who was the king of Majapahit during the 14th century, and he had the assistance and support of a pati or a prime minister by the name of Gajah Mada, who was a very capable prime minister, 
probably as capable as some of the great prime ministers that New Zealand has had. And they basically maneuvered their way around Southeast Asia from all the way the inlands of Thailand and all the way to the inlands of New Guinea. And that sort of like allowed Indonesia to put its mark back on the global map. And it kind of slept again for hundreds of years. And we got a wake up call. That wake up call was in 1945 when we were allowed to become independent by way of the end of the Second World War. And that also marked the beginning of a new economic system that prevailed for decades until it got tested, or the boundaries of which got tested quite seriously in the last few years, especially in 2008. And that would have been the Bretton Woods paradigm. And Indonesia, I think, has prevailed in ways that many have been proud of, particularly Indonesians. If we were to characterize how Indonesia has prevailed since becoming independent in 1945, we can peel it probably in three different carvings. First would have been the leadership of the founder, Sukarno. And at that time, during his decades of leadership, uh, anybody that would have questioned or challenged the revolutionaries would have been gotten or given the kiss of death. And fast forward, we had a guy by the name of Suharto, who was the leader of our country for a little more than three decades. And within that regime, it was the communists that was the kiss of death. Then transpired a number of transitioning regimes under Uzdur, Habibi, Guzdur, and Megawati, where we actually started with the notion of democracy. And the democratization took place and until our current leader, President Susilo Bambamiloyono, became the first directly elected president of the nation in 2004. I think at which time Indonesia was a little more ready and mature in terms of its democratizing itself and it became a changed nation whether it's political, social, economic, or even geopolitical. While all these changes took place, the world was also changing. We saw the end of the Cold War about 20 years ago, before which there was polarity in the world. You either go this way or that way. By the end of the Cold War, the world kind of expected that bipolarity to end, but it actually changed differently. It became a lot more diverse. We had centers of powers in China, in Russia, in India, in South America, in the Middle East, in Africa, and in ASEAN. And ASEAN became a cocoon of economic success, but it was also within a cocoon of a greater economic success called the Asia-Pacific community. And this basically has transpired into a large pool of economic activities that make up about 55% of the global GDP, but the economic growth rate, or the GDP growth rate, represents about 60 to 65% of the global economic growth rate. And the whole community of Asia Pacific makes up, from a trade or investment standpoint, about 45 to 50%. It becomes the symbol of economic success. And this, I think, has dovetailed into a number of regional integration activities that the ASEAN community, that the Asia Pacific community, and that some within and at peripheries have tried to strike. That could include the TPP, which we might have seen as an effort by many economies, including the US, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, and three other ASEAN economies to try to liberalize trade in ways that have never been seen before. It's good. It's good because trade creates jobs. That's pretty much how Indonesia fits into this ever-evolving global situation. Now, second is with respect to 
how Indonesia's economy is, how it has developed. Indonesia, by way of its becoming or having become the third largest democracy, consisting of many Muslim moderates, which make up the biggest Muslim population in the world, I think have tried to put their own mark on the global map. It has become a $1.1 trillion economy, the largest in Southeast Asia, compared to that of Singapore, that of Malaysia being the second and third largest, or third and second largest respectively in Southeast Asia. It has been moving somewhat in the right direction. From a fiscal standpoint, we have gone from being politically and economically, well, economically more abundant to being one of the most prudent in the world. Our fiscal swing has been huge, you know, in our pendulum. We used to have a debt to GDP ratio of close to 100%. By the early part of this year, we have a debt to GDP ratio of only 23%. In the next two to three years, we're likely to further lower that to hopefully less than 20%. It is a fiscal posture that I know many economies would salivate over, would dream for. I'm not talking about the Europeans. <laughs> and on top of this, from a monetary standpoint, we've also been able to manage inflation in a rather good way. Last year our inflation was managed at a mere 3.79 percent compared to my days as a banker. In 1998 I remember inflation was only around 80 percent. <laughs> yes, and let's not forget within weeks the rupiah depreciated by hugely. My salary dropped by 85 percent in dollar terms. It gives you a sense of how difficult things were, and it gives you a sense of how the Indonesians desired or decided to change from that moment of difficulty to where we are now. I'm not saying we're perfect, but I think we have gotten accustomed to basically not wanting to do certain things that are bad and wanting to do certain things that are good for us. So. Fiscally, I think we're pretty sound, and we've also decentralized our fiscal posture. The regions, you know, made up of the 33 provinces, have received a much bigger chunk of the pie than they ever were five to ten years ago. Monetarily, I think we're right on track in terms of managing prices, but I gotta caution you, a good chunk of our consumer price index comes from our eating chili eat a lot of hot stuff. And Chile makes up about 0.86% of our inflation. So if, yes, to give you a hint of how we can actually manage inflation, we just have to eat less chili. <laughs> and of course, if we take a look around, many of the economies around the world, particularly in Asia, we see an increasing number of disconnects where in some contractionary economy, we're also seeing an inflationary environment. This particular disconnect is attributable to, I think, two things. The first being basically the volatility of food prices, and the second being the volatility of commodities prices. And I think going forward, somebody, or some people, or everybody, ought to look at ways of providing more oversight on how those prices of commodities and foods have to be better regulated so that the millions of people in Africa, the millions in Asia Pacific, the millions in everywhere else in the world are not vulnerable or as vulnerable as they might have been in the past few years. The challenge for Indonesia, in spite of all these good things that are happening, is education. We're not as educated as some of our peers, some of our neighbors in Singapore, in Malaysia, in China, in Japan, and in India. We only have fewer than 2,000 or 20,000 PhDs as compared to 600,000 in China and India. 
respectively. I think we've got to game change this a lot more proactively. We don't have as many patents produced as China and India do. We go back to the records of 2010, Indonesia only produced a few more than 5,000 patents as compared to about 350,000 by China and Japan each. That's staggering. And it tells you about where we are on the value chain and where we have to go. Now, where we have to go is very clear, up. We don't want to go down on the value chain. This, I think, has basically dovetailed into some of the policies that we're trying to concoct from an economic standpoint so that Indonesia can have a better future for my kids and grandkids, hopefully. Now, that basically relates to the future, which is the third part of my conversation. The future of Indonesia, I think, is pretty good, barring catastrophic scenarios. If we were to allude to pontifications made by Standard Charger, or even McKinsey Global Institute, which came out with a report just four weeks ago, it's glowing. By the way, we didn't pay them to come out with this report. <laughs> It's glowing of Indonesia in that Indonesia, being a $1.1 trillion economy, has about 45 million people that are consuming. And I gotta tell you, Indonesia is blessed with the demographic dividends. We're young. 60% of our population are younger than 39 years old. 50% of our population are younger than 29 years old. I always make reference to the fact that we got a bunch of people in Indonesia who are just craving to listen to Jay-Z, Selena Gomez, Lady Gaga, and Justin Bieber. <laughs> I can't name any Kiwi artists yet, but please feel free to give me some names later so I can modify my speech later. Uh, these are kids who are hungry for not just pop culture, but they're hungry for education. And here's the key. Will we have enough money to spend on the right stuff? Yes, we do. Now, we take a look at the reports that have been made by some of these institutions. It tells the story, and it tells the trajectory of Indonesia. It tells all the directionality. If we were to accumulate the GDPs of Indonesia going from 2011 all the way to 2030, going from 1 trillion to about 7 trillion US dollars in 2030, the accumulation of the GDPs roughly is around 50 to 60 trillion US dollars. It's huge. It's a lot of cake for any Kiwi to participate. Now, if we take the approach that 60% of that is going to relate to the domestic consumption, we know there's about $36 trillion worth of consumption that's going to be done in a 20-year period between 2010 or 11 until 2030. Now, if anybody wants to trade with Indonesia or participate in trading involving Indonesia, Trade has always been making up about 50% of the GDP, both exports and imports. Exports make up about 26% of the GDP, imports make up about 24% of the GDP. So 50% of the GDP or the accumulation of the GDPs in the next 20 years is about 30 trillion US dollars. Now how much is the investment? If we were to support the trajectory that this economy is going to grow at five and a half to six and a half percent per year, investments or fixed capital formation make up about 30% of the GDP. So we know there's about 18 trillion dollars worth of fixed capital formation that's required in that next 18 to 20 year period for the economy to grow at five and a half to six and a half percent. There's a lot of opportunities, ladies and gentlemen, for everybody. All this is not going to be supported by just the Indonesians in Indonesia. All this will have to be supported by everybody around the world. And I think New Zealand presents an opportunity for New Zealand and Indonesia. And 
this is basically the message that I conveyed to your Prime Minister this morning, and the same message that I'm going to be conveying to your Minister of Trade, who's a good friend of mine, Tim Grosser, and we're going to be talking about how we can game change this. Now, let's talk about how much money we're going to spend on education. Typically, the budget, or the government budget, is about 20% of the GDP. And of that government budget, 20% relates to education. To do the math real quickly, that 20% for education in the next 20 years is going to be roughly $2.4 trillion. That's how much the Indonesian government is going to be spending on education. Now that would include basically the expenditures on fixing the dilapidated buildings all around Indonesia and the 33 provinces, but also ramping up the number of PhDs from 20,000 to hopefully around 200,000. We're not asking for 600,000. We're a lot smaller than China. But if we can get 200,000 PhDs in the next 15 to 20 years, I can almost guarantee you there's a good possibility that the future Steve Jobs could be born in Papua. There's a good possibility that the next guy who's going to create the next Google could be born out of Indonesia. Now, we just got to figure out out of these 150 to 200,000 PhDs, how many corresponding numbers for masters and bachelors, and how many we have to splice it up into the different faculties or fields, whether it's social sciences, engineering, or what, or what have you, so that we can actually grow on a much more sustainable basis. I take comfort in the fact that we've got a lot of youth, and the bonus is that Indonesians love to reproduce. At the rate we reproduce, we're going to have the same demographic profile 10 to 15 years from today as we do today. So we've got to make sure that we pump enough vitamins and software into these kids that are going to be born in the next 10 to 20 years. We're going to have to make sure that they go to the University of Auckland. We're going to have to make sure that they eat the right amount of beef and protein and what have you. We only consume two kilograms of meat per capita per year, ladies and gentlemen. Small. The Germans eat about 40 kilograms of meat per capita per year. And I tell them that's why they make the Mercedes Benz. <laughs> we don't make Mercedes Benz because we are just not consumers of protein. We're enough protein. We've got to eat more chicken, more fish, and more beef. Now, let's do the math. If we were to ramp up, the consumption of beef on per capita per year basis from 2 kilograms to about 20 to 22 kilograms. We're not trying to be like Germans. Just to 20 to 22 kilograms. The price of beef right now is about $7 per kilogram. 22 kilograms times $7 times 250 million people. It's about $35 billion of business per year. It's easy math. As Bill Clinton said, it's the arithmetic. Now, I don't see how this is not going to be sexy for lots of New Zealand companies to want to participate in the formation and the making of a greater economy. And I think it's possible, but it's possible on some accounts if we do certain things right. I think we have shaped directionality, the right way, we have proven to the world that democratization has taken place. We're not a perfect democracy yet. There are certain things that we have to learn to do. But economically, we've also identified certain things that we've done right, certain things that we've done, done wrong. And I think there's an opportunity here for us to even better shape the directionality forward. The past it has been full of surprises. Actually, a lot more people have been surprised by our economic success than those that predicted it. But the future, I'm pretty certain, is going to be of less or fewer aberrations and anachronisms. Because we've defined ourselves 
a little bit better from a political and economic standpoint. All this basically translates to Indonesia's being on the cusp of a new economic renaissance. And this new economic renaissance, I think, will breed new confidence. New confidence in a social way, in a cultural way, in a political way, in a diplomatic way, and also in a geopolitical way. That, basically, ladies and gentlemen, is my message of goodwill on Indonesia. Thank you very much.